So welcome to uh, the Project Performed Electorate's Guide to, uh, California's Guide to the Immigration Debate. Um, the Project for Informed Electorate is an organization here on campus that seeks to inform voters and potential voters about politics and policy in a nonpartisan way using the tools of the academy. And so we're very glad that you showed up today. Our mission essentially is to educate people, right? And so tonight's event is intended to do that. Uh, immigration obviously has been a major issue and a major issue of contention, especially in the midterm elections and beyond. And there's so much misinformation in our world today. And so we're doing this event in order to try to sort of deal in this thing we call facts. Uh, we want to, you know, I don't know if you've heard of them, but, but we find them useful. And so the idea is that, that we're going to learn some things hopefully today about uh, the actual truth about uh, immigration issues. So we have a panel of experts here today to do that. Oh, and I'm Kim Nalder. I'm, the, I'm a professor in the political science department here and the director of the Project for an Informed Electorate. I also wanted to thank Patrick Bird. He's the graduate student assistant for the PI, and he's walking out. So, but, but he did an awful lot of the legwork for this event, so thank you so much to him and to the staff here at the new downtown school. If those of you who haven't been here before, this is the new Sacramento State downtown, and hopefully we'll have a lot of future events here too. Um, a few program notes before we get started. One is that we are recording this event, and it will be posted on our webpage. And uh, the camera is right up there, if you're wondering where the camera is. It's, it's for classroom use. And so if you ask a question afterwards, if you get to the microphone, because uh, otherwise I won't be able to hear you on the recording. That'd be great. And just be careful about what you shout out or whatever, because you know it'll live on forever on the internet. So our panelists today, we have um, Professor Christina Flores Victor, who's an assistant professor of political science at Sacramento State. She got her PhD in political science from UC Davis. Her work focuses on American politics, California politics, immigration, and Latinx politics. Recent projects include changing perceptions of discrimination within Latinx communities, how voters use ethnic and policy cues to make decisions, and how race and ethnicity impact support for redistributive social programs. She's a first generation scholar and a, an alumna of California State University, Sacramento. I'll introduce each of them as, as, the, as they go. So if you would begin, please. Oh, and the other thing is we'll do Q&A after the three present, please. It's of barriers at the border or walls or fences and kind of the evolution of immigration enforcement, how enforcement has moved from being mostly enforcement along the border to interior enforcement. So that'll be the subjects that I'll cover. And mainly just to kind of try to contextualize the immigration debate that we're having currently. So what's kind of come before us. So just to real, let's just start at the beginning, right? We're mostly talking about immigration enforcement in terms of the southern border. That will be mostly the topic for tonight. Um, the border is approximately 2,000 miles long. Um, approximately 700 miles of it already has some sort of border fence along it. Um, the Rio Grande is a, about 1,200 miles long, so that's the other part of the 2,000 miles is formed by a natural border, uh, the river. Um, it does encompass 23 different U.S. counties that are along the border in the different states, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, and there are 48 different um, or I'm sorry, 39 Mexican municipalities that are along the border on the other side. Um, along this border, there are 48 U.S.-Mexico border crossings, official border crossing areas, and there are 330 um, points of entry. So some border crossings will have multiple points of entry. Um, so 330, quite a bit. Let's take a look at some of the busiest border crossings is in San Diego, California. It's the San, um, San Ysidro crossing. Uh, approximately per year, 8 million pedestrians cross. Around 21 million to 23 million personal vehicles cross. Um, trucks don't cross at this crossing. They cross further on down. Um, but around 29 million crossings per year at this particular one. So here's a different 
viewpoint of that same crossing. Um, at peak commute time, it can be anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours to cross at this border crossing. And it's the same for pedestrians. So pedestrians wait in a line just like cars have to wait in a line. And trucks are a little way down the road at one of the other busiest crossings in California. Um, economic output at the border is pretty high. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars per day are exchanged as people go to work, they go to classes, um, they bring economic goods back and forth across the border, shopping, other types of trade. So having these points of entry across the border open is beneficial to us in the United States and it's beneficial to those municipalities on the Mexican side too. Okay, so a brief context of the different agencies that are involved in immigration enforcement. Um, if you are a little older, you might remember INS, Immigration and Naturalization Services, was the kind of original um, organization. This was under the Justice Department, you can see here. And the mission of INS did always involve the deportation of immigrants who were undocumented. And they sometimes staged workplace raids also but it never really had a large enough workforce that they could kind of systematically engage in the level of um, removals that we're seeing here today. And they weren't quite as active in the interior of the country as maybe we would think of ICE or Border Patrol along the border right now. Um, the other agency that we're very interested in when we talk about enforcement along the border is of course the United States Border Control. So this is a branch of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and it falls now, post 9-11, under the Department of Homeland Security. So they have approximately at this time 20,000 agents that work for the Border Patrol and an annual budget of just under $4 billion. Um, Border Patrol does have a very traditional mission, right? They're looking to stop undocumented immigrants, and they're also interested in the illegal drug trade. And basically anything or anybody that's crossing um, not in a designated point of entry. Um, the southwest border has about 16,000 of those 20,000 agents. Another kind of 2,000 agents are along the northern border, and about a couple hundred are assigned to coastal regions. So that's kind of how the distribution of what they look like. Um, border Patrol does have additional interior checkpoints along the border. So they have 33 permanent traffic checkpoints. So these are anywhere from 25 to 75 miles inland. So they're not border checkpoints. They're inside on major highways and thoroughfares where they have permanent checkpoints where they are checking people's papers and documentation as they kind of drive around. There's an additional 71 traffic checkpoints that uh, change locations. So all along the border from this kind of 25 to 75 mile zone, they also have additional checkpoints that they staff and man. The other big immigration enforcement agency is ICE, right? So this agency did not exist prior to 9-11. This was um, conceived of and implemented post 9-11. This is a sister agency to Border Patrol, but they are not the same. So ICE does interior enforcement, right, where Border Patrol is along the border in that band that they patrol. Um, ICE is also under Department of Homeland Security, and um, ICE, Immigration Enforcement through ICE, has one of the highest priorities in the budget of all law enforcement agencies. So ICE spent 14, um, I'm sorry, $18 billion on immigration enforcement. All other criminal, federal criminal agencies combined spent $14 billion. So ICE outspends the FBI, the Bureau of Al Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Explosive, U.S. Marshals, uh, the DEA, the Secret Service. All of those other agencies combined are 14 billion and ICE and Immigration and Customs Enforcement is 18 billion. So only post 9-11, it's grown to that size. That's annually, yes. Okay, let's talk a little bit about actual border barriers um, in California. So this is a map of the California in San Diego. And if you can see these 
orange lines here, that's areas where we have existing fence. And if you're looking and you're saying like, oh, it looks weird, it looks like squiggly lines, like there's multiple lines. Yes, there are. And this is purposeful design. The idea behind the fence is that there will be multiple layers of fence. Double fence for sure, in a lot of areas they have triple fence. So these are different barriers. And if you can see, it does extend right into the ocean there. So this is in San Diego. We have areas where we've built this uh, triple fence. This is the fence that extends out into the Pacific Ocean. So, and the see-through design is purposeful, right? They want to be able to see through the fence to see who is on the other side for Border Patrol agents to be able to kind of visually inspect the other side of the fence. So you'll see a lot of this see-through design. Here's another barrier. This is in San Diego. Um, a lot of fences or walls have, uh, you'll see there's no real one kind of style that's used in every city and town. The, the wall or the barriers look different. But again, this style here where you can kind of see through part of it, they're anywhere from 8 to 12 to 16 feet tall, depending on kind of whether they're in urban areas or rural areas or along roads or out in deserts. Here is a fence in El Paso. El Paso was one of the towns where the really big push to start actually enforcing on the border with a strong show of agents. This is one of the first cities where we saw this big push, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, in 1993, they hired a lot more agents to actually patrol along the border, and they saw their apprehensions fall in one year from 286,000 apprehensions in El Paso to the next year, 80,000. So the number of apprehensions dropped by 200,000 people because people weren't crossing at this place anymore, right? They were going to different places to cross. Here's another type of fence that you might not have seen very often. This is called a vehicle fence, and it's just specifically in less populated areas to keep people from driving across the actual border, right? So you'll see a lot of this, um, especially out in the Arizona desert or the New Mexico desert. It's much um, less expensive, right? And it's really just there for vehicles along highways. The double fence, yes? Um, uh, hopefully you can see this. In the foreground, you have the lower uh, not see-through fence, which would be about eight feet tall. And then behind, up on the hill, you can see the taller fence. And the taller fence will be built and it'll angle out towards where people would, might try to climb up or come over. So this double fence, as I showed you with the map of San Diego, is quite common. That space in between the two fences is where the Border Patrol patrols, where they drive their vehicles, and that space in between will be lit up with like stadium lights, and that's where the sensors will be on the ground too. So if you get over the first barrier and you're walking across to the second barrier, you've tripped a sensor, the lights will come on, and the Border Patrol can come up and down that road there. Uh, this is an example of a fence in Arizona in the desert, smaller, right? Not as many people crossing here, mostly meant to keep vehicles and things like that from crossing at the border. So this is kind of interesting, I think, this map. The circles on the map are going to show you the official points of entry. And then the orange dashes on the map are going to show you where there are fences around official points of entry. So we've really used points of entry and then built fences in either direction going in the opposite way, right? So people who are coming in official point of entry and maybe they don't have papers or documentation, they're looking to go around that point of entry because it's a major highway or it's connecting two towns, they build fence out from all these points of entry. And so you can see the spacing in between the points of entry are less populated areas, they might not have roads nearby, and these are the areas I think that people who would like to build more barriers would like to build in this area. Here's another example showing um, the areas that we don't have some sort of barrier. And as you can see along the border, we have at this time <coughs> barriers along most of the kind of physical border where there can be a barrier because we have that 1200 miles along the Rio Grande and so areas where we can build a barrier we've already built a barrier in most of these areas some of the areas where you see stops in between there are mountain ranges and other things that make it more difficult to put a barrier in that place 
Um, over the years, we've had an increase in the number of people working for the Border Patrol and later on for ICE. There's all these different sets of operations, right? So Operation Hold the Line, Operation Blockade, Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Rio Grande. These are localized efforts to build fence in different areas. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of them here. Um, and in 1993 to 2000, this is when we see an increase in Border Patrol, five-fold increase in the number of agents that work for Border Patrol during this time. So Operation Hold the Line was in El Paso, Texas. As I mentioned a couple of slides ago, this was the, one of the very first ones where we built 20 miles of fence. Um, we had previously been focused on kind of finding and deporting immigrants who had already crossed, and we weren't really in in the game of trying to capture people at the border. We were looking for people who had already crossed into the U.S. and then deporting them if they didn't have documentation. But this was one of the first times where we say, no, we're actually going to man across the border and put so many Border Patrol agents that people won't cross unauthorized. Um, they, as they put more people along the border, it pushed people into different areas of entry, right? And so we saw an increase in the number of migrant deaths as people moved out into the desert to cross in different areas. And the other thing we saw is that as we began to patrol the border more, people stayed longer. So instead of making trips to work and going back to Mexico and then coming to work again, they came to the U.S. and they stayed because they were worried about going home and not being able to get back in. So we actually saw people just stay longer in the U.S., so kind of maybe an unintended consequence. Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego was just like the operation in El Paso, except it was in San Diego, right? So we're trying to build fence. Uh, we build 14 miles of fence from the ocean into kind of downtown San Diego. We have these different phases where then we go from San Diego down uh, into Imperial County and from Imperial County towards Arizona. So these different kind of phases of fence and barrier building. We're also at this time, and I talked about this already, putting in the stadium lighting, the infrared, the sensors. So we're putting in other types of barriers or things to help the Border Patrol patrol along the border. And during this time, this is when the INS budget had doubled, and the number of agents had doubled, the number of barriers had doubled, the number of sensors had tripled. So this is huge kind of movement to patrol and enforce immigration along the border. Uh, last one I'll talk about is the Secure Fence Act. This was under George Bush. This um, act gave $1.4 billion and authorized the building of 700 miles of fence. The $1.4 billion was not enough to pay for the 700 miles of fence, um, which might be kind of like what's happening right now, right? We want to authorize the wall or the barrier, but not all of the money to pay for it. So it was only partially funded. Um, and it was also part of that money was for replacing um, parts of wall or fence that already had been damaged in some way. Um, and we added in vehicle barriers, checkpoints, lighting, camera, satellites. And here we move also to unmanned aerial vehicles. So we're using drones to patrol the border as well, especially in the areas uh, in between cities and the more rural areas. But the Secure Fence Act was a huge step forward in building miles and miles of fence along all those areas that previously didn't have fence before. Um, so now in our current area era, we have um, in 2009, we did 649 miles of fence. We keep building fence because in a lot of areas, they want the double fence, they want the triple fence. So we have in this time period, 37 miles of secondary fencing put in. This is typically in more urban areas or more trafficked areas. And 14 miles of tertiary fencing, which means those extra additional borders around highways. Um, we also start to do the virtual fence, right? That's with the satellites and the drones. And during this time, especially in Arizona, you see a huge increase in migrant deaths as they cross in areas of the desert and the heat and the distance you have to go between where you started and when you finish up makes the, the trip much more dangerous. Um, in 2012, Republican Party platform was to put in more of the double layer fencing. 
um, but the high cost kept them from finishing this project. Um, in 2015, fences were breached almost 9,000, over 9,000 times. The average cost to repair a breach is around $800. So as they build the fence, it's being breached, they have to repair the fence, so that kind of cuts down on the amount of budget they have for building new fence or double layers of fence. And of course in 2016, um, then candidate Trump and now President Trump called for a border wall. So this is actually something different before we had built fence, right? We were always building fence and shorter barriers. The border wall that he called for was, he originally called for as high as 55 feet, so we had been doing eight feet, 12 feet, 16 feet. The border wall that he called for was 55 feet for all 2,000 miles of the southwest border, which you might be thinking if you've seen the map now, it could be tricky because we have 1,200 miles of river, so we have to decide which side of the river the wall would go on, and for it to be built of concrete, rebar, and steel which again is different than the other types of fence that we've already seen, right? It would, at first, I think when it was first conceived, it was conceived of as a um, non-see-through, right? Like a thick, solid wall that you wouldn't be able to see through. Um, we do have some environmental and practical constraints to this kind of enforcement along the border. Uh, a lot of environmental issues as habitats are kind of broken up and animals don't have the range to go back and forth to look for food and for water. So if they get kind of stranded on one side, they might cut their habitat in half. Um, also, plants, landowners, we see from uh, the Secure Fence Act in 2006, some of the landowners are still litigating um, the use of their land for the fence. I will show you two more slides and then I'll move on. Um, so apprehensions at the southern border over time. Oh, sorry. In 1960, we see this increase in 70s, 80s, and 90s. And then after all these different operations with all the fence building, we see the number of apprehensions drop off. It's kind of hard for us to separate. Is this the fence? Or is it the number of border patrol? Is it economic conditions in the U.S. and Mexico that's changed? Is it people's, uh, the cycle of migration has changed and they're staying longer, that's why they're not coming across anymore. And then this last one here, um, apprehensions, border agents, and budget. So the magenta line is the budget, how it is increased for Border Patrol over time. The teal line is apprehensions, and that's gone down over time as we've put more Border Patrol agents in, and um, as the budget and Border P agents have gone in. So I'll turn it over now, over now. Thank you so much for that. That was very helpful. <laughs> Next we have Kevin Waldhagen. He has worked for the International Rescue Committee for three years where he started as a resettlement caseworker assisting newly arrived refugees in the United States. During the year of 2017, the IRC Sacramento office resettled more refugees and what's SIVs? Uh, special, Im special immigrant visa holders. Uh, they assisted with the, the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, so they resettled more S refugees and SIVs than any other resettlement office in the United States. He now works in the Immigration Services Department at IRC, assisting people in applying for citizenship, green cards, and family visas. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry I don't have any slides. Um, most of my presentations have to do with like how to become a US citizen. Um, but I'll talk to you um, a little bit about um, what IRC does internationally, um, how that's reflected here in Sacramento, and then more specifically about immigration. Um, so um, IRC was founded in 1993 at the bequest of Albert Einstein, uh, who himself was fleeing uh, war-torn Europe as a refugee. Um, since that time, uh, IRC has grown to uh, be in over 37 different countries. Um, and, uh, or I'm sorry, 40 different countries, um, helping resettle refugees sort of uh, world uh, in, um, with the, the assistance of the United Nations um, High Council for Refugees. Um, 
at this time, there's about 68 million um, forcibly displaced people in the world. Uh, 25 million of those are registered with the UN as refugees, um, but less of, than 1% of those actually get resettled into a third country. Um, the United States used to take in about half of that number, um, around 80,000 a year. Um, under Obama, it jumped up to uh, 110, and currently um, it's uh, projected, uh, or the cap was put at 50,000, but likely to see more like 30,000 this year. Um, what IRC does um, internationally is um, assist with crisis areas. So um, programs range from uh, water and safety, disease response, um, leading the front lines of crisis zones. Um, generally speaking, IRC is there within 72 hours in any sort of humanitarian crisis in the world uh, to provide services. Um, what IRC does in the United States is uh, predominantly help resettle refugees. Um, so um, before that process happens, uh, the um, refugees have to go through 20 plus security check process, um, and that's before they even get to um, uh, US uh, uh, CIS's uh, clearance, or so US CIS's citizenship and immigration services, uh, previously known as INS. Um, they're the ones who do all the interviews for being able to come to the United States um, in conjunction with the Department of State. Um, and so just to get through the UN United Nations security, security checks, it takes about 20 different uh, step security process, and then Department of State works with uh, nine different re resettlement agencies to get them here into the United States. Once they're here, um, the refugee resettlement period is 90 days. Um, 90 days is not very much time uh, of assistance in, in order to uh, um, support a new family in a new place uh, where they don't know how anything works. Um, our services go much beyond that. So um, uh, being able to uh, connect them with an employment program, uh, one huge piece of being able to resettle in the United States is being able to find a job. Um, maybe very different here uh, than it was back in their home country. And so they have um, uh, lots of resources um, uh, in assisting people in looking for a job, writing a resume, um, et cetera. Uh, for those that aren't quite uh, employment abled, um, there is a intensive case management, so it just helps them with any sort of medical issues they have, uh, or if they um, are elderly or disabled, uh, helping them access uh, social security uh, income or supplemental security income, um, various other uh, services for those experiencing extreme barriers. Um, another service in that same sort of uh, department is uh, helping with victims of trafficking. Um, so um, those don't need to be designated as, as refugees. Uh, by definition, victims of trafficking oftentimes have no status. Um, and so our office seeks to um, uh, provide service for victims of trafficking and make appropriate referrals to um, attorneys who can get them legal status. Um, in terms of Sacramento uh, resettlement, um, as uh, it was said earlier, um, Sacramento is one of the biggest sites for refugee resettlement in the United States. Uh, over the last three years, uh, 13,000 refugees and SIVs, special immigrant visa holders, um, have been resettled here. Um, 2017, IRC saw the most out of any uh, resettlement agency in the nation. Uh, 1,900 people were resettled through our office um, and other uh, sister organizations, World Relief, Opening Doors, also settled around the same amount of numbers. It's a lot of people coming into the same Sacramento area at one time. Um, there are, mentioned employment, um, some of the biggest barriers uh, that our clients are seeing is rising rent. Um, so while rent has increased 10% here in Sacramento over the past couple of years, um, uh, the uh, amount of uh, benefits that they receive uh, have not gone up. Um, refugees receive $925 per person to help them res with resettlement costs. Um, that has to go to rent, deposit, furniture, um, and pretty much everything else uh, that goes into their apartment. It's not very much. Um, so rent is a huge barrier for their, also learning a new language, uh, especially for uh, older folks. Um, but then also people who are uh, perfectly able-bodied, uh, just being able to um, 
learn English is uh, a huge, huge barrier to their uh, integration into the Sacramento area. Um, we have lots of other uh, services. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of them. We have a, you know, tax preparation services, helping them appropriately file their taxes. That's going on right now. There's also new routes. We have community gardens that are, um, each plot is owned and administered by a refugee or refugee who was resettled maybe a generation ago. Um, and, uh, you know, growing fruits and vegetables that are more familiar to them, and then they sell them at a farmer's market um, on site. Uh, the closest one is uh, right over here in West Sacramento. Um, and then finally, uh, immigration. Um, so I worked in refugee resettlement for two years, uh, and about last year I transitioned to the Immigration Services Department. Um, our biggest push is citizenship, helping people apply for citizenship and all the benefits that are entailed there, um, but also additionally helping people um, guide them through the uh, green card process and uh, family-based visas. So if you have a relative abroad and you'd like to bring them over, helping th them through that uh, long process. Um, our department is much different than the rest of the departments at International Rescue Committee. Uh, most of those are only open to refugees and asylees. Um, there are some exceptions to those. Um, but in immigration, we can serve you if you're from Mexico or Afghanistan or Sierra Leone. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, additionally, we can help you if you're undocumented or U.S. citizen or if you have DACA. We can help renew DACA. Um, so there's uh, much, much different sort of set of services in our immigration department. Um, in, in our current climate um, of uh, immigration, um, a lot is talked about um, stopping illegal immigration, um, but this administration is doing a lot to stop legal immigration too. Um, there's not a whole lot that can be done without altering the law, and that would take an act of Congress. Um, but procedurally, a lot of things are happening um, consistently. So um, these things can be as uh, headline grabbing as like ending DACA or se se separating uh, asylum seekers from their children. Um, but it also can be as mundane as adding more questions to the citizenship application or um, changing the guidance on how uh, public benefits ex uh, affects you getting a green card. Um, and so more than ever, our immigrant and refugee communities need um, support. Uh, and you know that comes in uh, the form of refugee resettlement, but it also comes in uh, the form of like quality legal advice. Um, so um, IRC is uh, making uh, great efforts at trying to address all of these different barriers that uh, refugees and uh, immigrants face in general. It's a very supportive crowd. I appreciate that. Uh, and then we have um, Eric Ramirez, who's born in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And he moved to California at the age of four, where he grew up on the Central Coast. He earned a BA in Communication Studies from Sac State in 2016 and is on track to graduate this May with an MA in Communication Studies. He currently serves as the point of contact at the Dreamer Resource Center at Sacramento State. And in that role, he helps oversee programming to stimulate the academic success of undocumented students and students from mixed status families. He also serves as the ASI, which is our student government at Sac State, Director of Graduate Studies, and sits on various committees where he advocates for more equitable practices and inclusive spaces for students from all underrepresented groups. Hi, good evening. <clears throat> so I will be talking to you about DACA specifically. So an overview of the presentation, I hope to answer three main questions for you. What is DACA? What is the current status of DACA? And what have been the effects of DACA? So what were the results since it has been implemented or since it, it took uh, effect? So what is DACA? So DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's an executive order that was signed by President Obama in 2012. 
And the order provides temporary relief from deportation and a two-year renewable work permit to immigrants brought to the U.S. as children. Um, and you essentially had to meet certain criteria in order to be able to apply and receive deferred action. But at the core of it is you were brought to the U.S. as a child, you grew up in this country, you then admit that you've been here, you come out of the shadows per se, and you are granted um, protection from deportation and a two-year renewable work permit. So what were some of the initial requirements or what, what did you need to do, what did you need to uh, be able to meet in order to receive deferred action? So first of all, when it was originally implemented in 2012, um, you had to have been born on or before June 16th of 1981. So they capped it at 35 years old. Um, you also had to have arrived to the U.S. before the age of 16. You need to have lived continuously in the U.S. since June 15, 2007. And you need to have been physically present in the U.S. on June 5, 2012, which was when the executive order was signed, um, and also at the time of making the request for consideration of deferred action. So you need to have been here for, for some time in order to be able to even qualify for this. Um, additional requirements. So you, in order to receive deferred action, you needed to, at the time, either be in school or have graduated from high school or obtain a GED or have been honorably, di honorably discharged from the Coast Guard or the Armed Forces. You also have to pass a background check um, and uh, biometrics as well, so you do fingerprints. Uh, you can't have been convicted of any felony, uh, no significant misdemeanors, and you can't have three or more other misdemeanors. Um, in addition, you have to be deemed that you do not otherwise pose a threat to national security or public safety, which typically they, it looks at like um, whether you're involved in gangs, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's a four to hundred and ninety-five dollar fee that you pay initially and every time you renew as well. And so the process, it, because it is just a two-year renewable work permit, it takes about six months for them to process. So in reality, you're, review, you're renewing about a year and a half. Every year and a half or so, um, you're going through the process of renewing this, this uh, deferred action. So having told you, you know, what, what DACA is, what it grants for, for these individuals, and um, what the requirements were, I want to address a little bit about some of the myths or the misinformation surrounding DACA. And the first thing is that there's oftentimes a belief that DACA is some sort of citizenship, which is completely false. Um, DACA is not a permanent protection. Again, it is a two-year renewable uh, permit. You have to keep applying every two years. Um, it does not provide any path toward legal permanent residency, residency or citizenship. And d your DACA, your protection can be revoked and recipients can be deported, particularly if you commit some sort of crime, um, then you are on the radar and, and you can then be deported. Um, so it's, it doesn't grant um, protection against complete deportation. And also, again, it's not a permanent fix by any means. It was just an executive order um, that, that President Obama um, signed. Some more kind of confusion or misinformation about DACA and the DREAM Act. So oftentimes we hear or people think that DACA and the DREAM Act are the same thing, which they are not. Uh, DACA is President Obama's answer to the DREAM Act, which was legislation that has been introduced in Congress, I believe every year since 2001, and it has continuously failed. And so Originally, that the name of that legislation was the DREAM Act. Obama then signed in DACA, right? And recipients of DACA became generally known as DREAMers. So when we hear the terminology DREAMers, it tends to refer to recipients of DACA. Nowadays, we're starting to see a different subgroup of undocumented students, which are typically AB 540 students, which I could do a whole other thing on, so I, I won't touch too much on that. But now we, ha we do have some students that when we hear the term dreamers, it's starting to be applied more broadly, but still, I believe, um, when most individuals use that term dreamer, they're referring to somebody who has DACA. So 
We also then have the California Dream Act, which I think tends to complicate the terminology a little bit as well. The California Dream Act has nothing to do with the Federal Dream Act. The California Dream Act is about financial aid. It essentially says that if you're an undocumented student in, in California and you meet certain requirements, you are eligible to receive financial aid to go to a community college or a four-year institution. But it does not, you, you're not eligible for any federal aid. It has nothing to do with your residency or your citizenship in this country. It is simply um, for benefits for financial aid in the state of California. So bottom line, there is no DREAM Act in this country. There has, it's never been passed. They've tried multiple times, including earlier this year, or end of last year. Um, but uh, there is no, no California DREAM Act. It's just DACA, DREAMers who are recipients of DACA. So then having laid down or laid a little bit of the groundwork and the terminology and, and having explained to you what DACA is and what some of the requirements are, let's now look at what is the current status of DACA because there have been some, uh, some happenings around the whole you know, DACA program. So the Trump administration announced in September of 2017 that they would be terminating DACA, citing um, or essentially arguing that the executive order that Obama had signed in 2012 was unconstitutional. Now at the time, President Trump called on Congress to find a permanent legislative fix. Um, his rhetoric was very supportive of DREAMers and he did state that he wanted to find something more permanent and, and tasked uh, Congress was with doing that. Um, there were efforts, legislative efforts, um, both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, uh, but ultimately all the votes that were put up, um, excuse me, all the bills that were put up to vote um, failed. So after uh, the Trump administration announced the termination of DACA, um, there was work that tried to get done in, in, in Congress, right? They tried to address the issue legislatively, but simultaneously there were several lawsuits that were filed against the Trump administration for ending DACA. Um, one of them is the Regents of the University of California versus the Department of Homeland Security. So it's the UC system, um, Janet Napolitano, um, and the entire UC system essentially arguing that um, ending DACA uh, violates some of the rights that were granted to these students in the first place um, unjustifiably. And so at, at this moment, the constitutionality excuse me, of DACA is being debated in the courts. Um, so Congress has, has tried again to, to get legislative action, uh, but has not succeeded. And so what happened most recently is just a couple weeks ago on February uh, 15th, the U.S. Supreme Court refused the Trump administration's cert petition. So essentially there were three active lawsuits that were going through the lower courts that ruled on the constitutionality of DACA. Two of them said that they, that DACA could not just be terminated by the administration. Um, and so the Trump administration petitioned the Supreme Court uh, to hear these cases and to rule whether DACA is constitutional or not. Um, the Supreme Court rejected that petition, um, essentially arguing that the cases need to go through the court systems, um, which in effect left two of the lower court rulings in place that do allow DACA holders to renew their, their status. So then that brings us to the current status of DACA. At this moment, USCIS is accepting renewal applications only. So you applied for it at some point, either you still have it and you keep renewing. Um, if you applied for DACA and it expired, it, it, the protection lapsed, you are able to reapply and it's considered a renewal because you had it initially but they are not accepting any brand new applications. So there are a lot of individuals that qualified for DACA, but that chose not to pursue the, the deferred action for various reasons, including fear of giving their personal information and admitting to the government that they were here. Um, and so bottom line, first time applicants are not eligible to apply. There is only the renewal process that's going on at the moment. To renew, the requirements remain essentially the same. You still have to pay the $495 fee um, every year and a half or so. You still need to be living in the U.S. continuously. Um, still need to pass that background check and the biometrics as well. So then what have been the results or the effects of DACA? What's happened um, 
you know, nationally and, and in this state as well. Um, so since DACA's inception, approximately 822,000 undocumented young people have received protection. And that, that's individual cases, um, whether they be initial or renewals. Um, in 2018, approximately 2,150 DACA recipients resided in the state of California. So um, a, good, a good portion of DACA recipients um, do reside in our state. Over 72,000 undocumented students are enrolled in California's public colleges and universities. About half have DACA protection. So again, we have another subset of undocumented students that did not qualify for DACA, typically because of age requirements. Um, and so we do have about, like I said, 72,000 students that are undocumented in the three systems of uh, public colleges and universities, community colleges, CSUs, UCs, about half of those students are uh, what we call DACA mented, so they have DACA protection. Uh, a recent study done last year by uh, Professor Tom Wong at uh, San Diego State University and a few other um, organizations uh, sample was about 1,050 participants, DACA recipients in 41 states. They found that 84, excuse me, 89 percent of respondents and 92 percent of those that were 25 or older are currently employed. So there tends to be um, a little bit of a uh, misbelief that all DACA students or all DACA recipients are students, and that's actually not the case. Um, a, a, a good amount of DACA recipients are everyday professionals. They are working in schools. Uh, as teachers, as counselors. Some of them are teaching at community colleges or universities as well. Um, so while we do have a lot of students that are DACA recipients, uh, a lot of them are also not. They're just professionals. 62% um, of the respondents in this survey uh, reported purchasing their first car after receiving DACA. I, I was one of those. 14% um, of respondents purchased their first home. It's about 20% among those that are 25 or older. And then 6% of respondents, 8% of those that were 25 or older started their own business, which actually outpaces the general population in terms of business creation. So then all of that means that DACA and the fact that these individuals have been granted the protection had an economic impact on our country and the state of California. So according to the American Action Forum, DACA recipients contribute about a net of $3.4 billion annually to the federal balance sheet and nearly $42 billion to the annual GDP. And in the state of California, according to the Center for American Progress, they estimate that ending DACA, so removing that protection, which would ultimately uh, leave a lot of these individuals at risk of deportation, um, would equate uh, in costing the state of California about $11.6 billion in annual, annual GDP losses. So there is a huge economic impact that comes from um, not only the, the work that these individuals do, but also just the fact that you know, we're out, they're out there purchasing cars, um, finding better jobs, their income is growing, things like that. Um, and that's all I have for you. Thank you so much. So we can open it up for questions now. If you have a question, if you could either go to the mic or flag me down and I'll bring you this mic. Hello. Okay, um, Christina, I have a question for you regarding the sensors that you were talking about um, for the double and triple fences. Is that throughout all of them? And also, are they on the single fence as well? The sensors? Um, it's not everywhere. Typically they use the sensors probably more often in areas where they aren't patrolled as much. Okay. So in more rural areas they'll have more sensors per square mile because there's just not as many agents to be along all those sections of the border. So once a sensor is tripped, then they're in their truck and they head out to check out the sensor. Okay. Which is why the double wall, I guess, is useful for them because if they trip the sensor in between the two walls or the two barriers, they have time in transit to get there and to apprehend people. Okay. So I think that's in general how the sensors are being deployed. Okay. And they're on the single fence as well or just on the double and triple? They're using them everywhere. Everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
And it's not just sensors. Sometimes they use the floodlights too, yeah. right? So if, they, if it's nighttime and the floodlights are tripped, it's the same thing, right? If the Border Patrol is sitting up on a hill, they can see down where the lights have been tripped and they can go down that way. I have a question. Um, so for Kevin, you mentioned that um, refugees who are resettled have a 90-day period of assistance from the federal government. I was wondering, because you also mentioned special immigrant visa holders, do they also have that 90-day period of assistance? Uh, yeah, so um, refugees um, and SIVs have different statuses, but um, SIVs do get a lot of same services that refugees get. Um, and so uh, when they are um, sort of, uh, when SIVs are issued their visa, uh, they're connected with IOM, International Organization for Migration. That's how they come to the United States. IOM works with the resettlement agencies here to connect them to services. Um, let them know that, hey, they're coming, they have this relative in town, connect with them, make sure that they can uh, assist in their resettlement, um, and then as soon as they land, the 90 days starts for both groups. Okay, and then I had a follow-up question. Um, you mentioned that Sacramento was the most pot, or had the most refugee resettlement. Do you mm -hmm. know why Sacramento in particular? Goodness, that's a great question. I've tried to figure that out myself. Um, I'm thinking it was because a generation ago, Afghanistan experienced the invasion of the Soviets um, and caused a refugee crisis then. Some of those ended up in the Bay Area. Um, Bay Area got too expensive. They made their way to Sacramento. And because refugee resettlement, typically you need to have a relative or U.S. tie. Um, Sacramento became a base for um, people from Afghanistan to come. Um, additionally, it's California good weather, uh, Sacramento's still relatively cheap, um, and it's more accepting of immigrants. So I think all of those things sort of taken together just created a, a, a sort of the perfect storm uh, for refugee resettlement. The only other site that is, has as much SIVs is uh, uh, Virginia, I believe. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, for Kevin, you said that your agency offers free um, consultations or legal services? Um, our services aren't free. There is a, um, we have Department of Justice accreditation. Uh, it's a specific okay. designation uh, given to nonprofit entities to be able to provide uh, immigration legal services. Um, so uh, our services are low cost and have to be predominantly available to low income people. Um, the uh, service fees pale in comparison to uh, lawyers um, and private uh, legal services. Um, so like a consultation is $25. We put that $25 towards the final application fee. Most things go around $100, but it really just depends upon the service. Okay, so it's on the clients to pay the filing fees? Um, depends on the uh, application. So if there's a USCIS fee waiver, yeah. um, you know, we make every effort to uh, be able to uh, assist them through that. Um, there's also um, Mission Asset Fund. They provide loans uh, to pay for the USCIS fees. There are no interest loans split up over 10 payments. And so we connect them to those resources if, you know, they can't afford the USCIS fees and don't qualify for a fee waiver or if that application doesn't have a fee waiver as like family petitions, they don't have fee waivers. Um, so we try to work with everyone and it's a requirement of our accreditation to can't turn away people just because they can't pay. Okay, so follow up. Um, so do your clients sign G28s when they, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you mostly help, you mentioned that you mostly help with citizenship. Yeah, that's like our biggest push, but you know, our accreditation uh, allows us to help with a variety of different issues, so. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, Mike. I have several questions I wanted to ask. Eric, um, first, what are the biggest needs uh, uh, of the students who come to your, uh, to your office in terms of services, in terms of needs? That's a great question. Thank you. So I would, uh, I would say that financial aid needs are typically what we deal with the most. So at our center, we're particularly working and serving students, right, at Sac State and in the community as well. Um, so that's a lot of what we see has to has to do with financial aid issues. So we have AB 540, which is the California Dream Act, like I mentioned in my in my presentation, which 
if you meet certain requirements, right? If you if you graduated from a high school in this in this state or you've been here for a certain amount of time, you can get financial aid to pay for your tuition. But students um, that do get financial aid from the state of California through this don't get any extra money to pay for rent or books or f meals, all these things. So that's one of the largest issues that we deal with is financial aid related issues. Mm -hmm. Questions about not only how to fill out the applications because they're very complicated, uh, but also you know, what other forms of aid are there available for me so I can pay for my classes and, and stay in school. Okay, great. Um, Kevin, um, since uh, the rhetoric and the, uh, uh, the politics of the Muslim ban uh, that Trump administration, Trump has been pushing for the past three years, how has that uh, affected the flow uh, of uh, folks from countries of the third world, particularly in, in Asia, Africa, and, and as well as the Middle East? Um, yeah, so the initial travel ban affected uh, mostly Muslim-majority countries, um, one of which is Syria, one of which is Iraq, um, one of which was Sudan. Uh, various uh, different iterations of that um, have shifted things around. Uh, one country that wasn't included was Afghanistan, um, and I think that's just because uh, there would have been so much pushback from Congress regarding that. Um, you know. Many Congress people from both sides of the aisle support uh, SIVs uh, because they supported the U.S. military in mm -hmm. Afghanistan and Iraq for so long. Um, but it, combined with the travel ban was also a complete stop to refugee resettlement. Um, and you know, refugee resettlement survives on uh, a very limited budget, both federally and also for uh, uh, local service providers. And so, essentially, like interviews stopped um, and getting that system going again takes a lot of effort. And even though it's beginning to go again, mm -hmm. um, the uh, so-called extreme vetting um, is really slowing that down as well. So right. um, additionally, the numbers have dropped to less than half. Um, Kamala Harris just recently signed on to support a bill that would put a uh, floor of refugee resettlement, so meaning that you can't go below this many people in a given year. Um, I don't know what the current status of that is, but that's one effort that's being made to ensure refugee resettlement survives into the future. Okay, thank you. And my final question, uh, uh, Christina, uh, um, in terms of the discussion that you might hear, and, and I have heard um, um, in the recent uh, election cycle, around open borders and, and, the, and the fact that, you know, the fencing and, you know, the border, you know, the walls are essentially immoral. You know, essentially, are cutting off uh, the opportunities for people. So, how do you see that within the debate about fencing and and just the whole thing about open borders, which is a kind of philosophical thing more than a practical thing, I would think. Well, before the big push in the '90s and going into the 2000s, there were a lot of communities along the border, like in El Paso and Arizona and San Diego, where people did cross daily and they have those 72 hour permits. So if you go through a process of applying and showing your Mexican national ID, you can get um, approved so that you can basically have, it's like a short term visa, like a three day visa for people who are constantly going back and forth for work. So every time you go across, it makes it a little bit faster for you. So prior to the 1990s and the early 2000s, I mean, this was more the norm, right? Where people were coming across to go to work and buses were taking people, like on their morning commute, they just crossed the border and went back. Um, but all the extra fencing and barriers and um, patrolling along the border really kind of broke up that idea that, you know, we need the, their community as much as they need our community kind of a thing. and. In some communities um, in Texas, there were students who go to college across the border and things like that kind of on a daily basis. So yeah, the idea of open borders, I guess, is more of maybe a philosophical argument, but I think in a lot of these local communities, uh, the towns that were across from each other, that was more of like a daily reality of um, selling goods and services and coming across for shopping and having family on both sides of the border. So I think it probably was closer to how things were in a lot of these communities 20, 30 years ago. Well, I can tell you, uh, you know, I grew up in San Diego, and I lived right across the street from a Catholic school. 
and it was a Catholic high school, and it was a girls' high school. And most of the women, most of the girls came from Tijuana. And they would come every day, and folks would come and pick them up and take them back every day. So, yeah, so I knew that was, you know, that was something that was, yeah, it was very open. So, you know, it was very useful, too. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, one of the things. I have a question about s political strategy, maybe for everyone. Um, I saw on the beautiful handout that you're quantifying the economic impact of DACA recipients and immigrants. And on the one hand, as much as I appreciate that, a lot of folks who are worried about their jobs are like, those are jobs being taken away from U.S. citizens and natives, and that's money that a uh, a U.S. born person could have used to buy a car, right? And so there's the threat to that kind of language. And is there a new discourse that's coming up about the unique political contributions that immigrants and DACA recipients are receiving, or the cultural value, or the intellectual value that immigrants bring that is part of these, part of the application process? It's not just quantified how much financial contribution are you going to offer, but how are you going to raise the level of our political consciousness, our cultural consciousness, our educational ability, enrich us in these other ways that might not be so captured by the economic stuff? And is that moving in a positive direction? Or are we trapped in the sort of narrow economic logic given Trump mm -hmm. and his push away from family issues and whether we're bringing in brain capital and that kind of stuff and that narrow reductivist logic of are you productive for the economy or not? So I'll start. So I, I appreciate the question. And yeah, there is there's some definite something or something to think about, right? What when you quantify um, the, these contributions, are you a opening yourself up for criticism of the, you know, the other side of the coin, essentially? But then what does it do for some of the other contributions, like you said, politically or culturally? I think that I mean, in just my opinion, I think that part of of just the way that we frame this is that you know, we like data, we like numbers. It's, it's, I believe, easier to quantify economic impact than cultural impact, right? Um, but I have, in some of the spaces that I've been where we've had these conversations, I can tell you that there's more people bringing up the fact that how do we move beyond simply talking about numbers and money, right? How do we move into discussing some of the other contributions that some of these individuals are, are bringing at, at our, in our local communities at the state level, at the national level as well. Um, so I, I don't have an exact answer for that other than just saying that I, I know that there are some individuals out there that are trying to kind of push that and you know, I, I, I'm curious and I'm, I'm excited to kind of see how that conversation shifts or, or how it evolves as we move forward. I, I would say too, from my research and it's definitely a conversation that's happening like about um, being careful of classifying people into like good groups of immigrants and bad groups of immigrants, right? Like the kind we want to keep and the kind that we should do things for and have policy solutions for and then the kind we're trying to keep out. And so I think that sometimes even though the language is done in a positive way and it's trying to frame things in a way that people will understand a contribution, it sometimes has unintended consequences, right? It's like, well, we don't want the, the poor ones then, right? We don't want the uneducated ones who are fleeing political violence or who are the unaccompanied minors because what can they provide for us, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that while it's useful to try and show what are they bringing to us, I do think that there are a lot of people that are having the conversation about like, in the long run is this helpful for us to frame immigrants as being like the good kind and then like we have the bad kind, mm -hmm. right? And we only wanna like be helpful to the good kind and the other ones like we keep in detention centers mm -hmm. indefinitely. And, yeah. and if I'm, oh sorry, please. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a difficult sort of, um, uh, as Eric said, it's, uh, it's difficult to, um, uh, 
move away from those more quantifiable things like being able to do research and present i mean i've always like there's a common statistic out there that refugees contribute on average more like twenty six thousand dollars more than they take in public benefits over the course of their lives and, um so like those sorts of data points are helpful for when you are um you know engaging with someone who um takes that as a a uh, an important piece, um, but I think more than anything, like re uh, refugees, uh, CIVs, and immigrant communities in general, um, they don't like dominate an economy or take away jobs. They they change the economy, so they create more jobs. They uh, do things that maybe um, weren't being done, or they participate in a growing economy. And so that may seem that they are taking jobs, but it's really more this: the economy itself is growing. There's more opportunities. Um, and that's not a bad thing. And so I think in, instead of um, like engage, like promoting that same sort of narrative, is just changing the narrative as much as you can. Um, and you can do that with facts, right? So. Um, regarding DACA, is there certain reasons why the renewal renewals every two years? I'm just wondering, because you, you said there it takes about six months, so it gives you a year and a half. Why is it so frequent? Do you know? I, I don't know other than that's just how the executive order was originally okay. written by President Obama okay. and his, his administration. Um, I, I, perhaps you, you, you know the answer to that. Uh, I, I, I do know that the employment authorization document that they get um, is a two-year document for almost anyone who gets it. Refugees get an employment authorization document and it expires after two years. So I think in just terms of simplicity of like, this benefit already exists, let's tie it to DACA and have it the same uh, uh, applicant or uh, validity period. Mm -hmm. I think it just made sense from an administrative pr perspective. Mm -hmm. I also think historically, um, there was like an opportunity of for a long time of just having a work permit, uh, not the same thing as the 72 hour sort of uh, um, border crossing card, but just having a work permit. Um, and then that was a two year document that was renewed uh, continually. As an income generator, essentially. All right, you guys are being too nice. <laughs> uh, my head explodes when I hear Trump give these damn statistics about immigration. Does your head explode? And if it does, what do you guys think about how you can articulate, uh, you know, a, a discourse that? you know, kind of deals with some of this bullshit that he puts out, you know, about, you know, about how the gangs are just coming through the borders, like, you know, like an invading army and, and all this other crap. How do y'all sit nice and quiet in your desk and not die every day and your hairs explode every day? Well, I'll try to, I'll start. Yeah, so you want to start that? Um, I think, yes, if that's, I mean, part of the reason why I wanted to talk about, um, you know, the barriers and the evolution of enforcement as my subject is that, you know, over the years we've actually seen less apprehensions. There's less people crossing the border. We have more Border Patrol and ICE agents, like five times as many. The budget for ICE outspends every other federal agency, law enforcement agency we have. So the idea that somehow we're doing a bad job at immigration enforcement and we need more is just not, the data just doesn't support that. There's no evidence for that. The number of crossings have gone down. The Mexican economy has improved while the U.S. economy, especially in 2008, dipped down. Um, so people just aren't coming as much from Mexico. The largest immigrant groups right now are Asian groups. But we're focused on the, the southern border. We're focused on apprehensions. And it's, it's you've built this huge apparatus for immigration enforcement. And now that you've kind of subsided apprehensions on the border, but you've built this apparatus, it's almost like you had to turn it to the interior of the country, which is what we're seeing now, right? The interior enforcement, the 287G communities in the early 2000s, uh, workplace raids, and other types of things and at the same time you hear from the top the administration this idea that somehow we're doing terribly at immigration enforcement we're being overrun and we have no idea who's here and how many people are here and you know like I told you in the talk there's 700 miles of 
barrier fence and double fencing and triple fencing and virtual fencing and you know almost 16,000 agents that patrol the border and the idea that what we need now is billions more spent on a different type of barrier and that somehow that would reduce the number of unauthorized immigrants in the country it just isn't supported by the evidence it's that an yeah and it's an emergency <laughs> yes to answer the question of how uh, to keep a level head during such times, um, you know, of course we all have moments where we get frustrated, um, but I think also it's important, uh, the work is too important to be caught up every single day in the frustration, you know. Um, and uh, as much as I get frustrated as an advocate, um, the people I serve, I can't imagine the frustration and the fear they feel um, every day. And so I take it upon myself as a responsibility to, um, you know, stay level-headed for them, being able to advocate for them, um, because, you know, for whatever reason, um, the U.S. government's going to listen to me more than them oftentimes, and uh, I have to remember that as my role as a, an advocate. I, I agree completely that I think in these, you know, in those times is when, number one, our work tends to go up at our center, right? Um, we used to tend to see more students who are concerned, um, who have questions, or who just need you know, someone to talk to. So yeah, how do you maintain a level? How do you focus on the students? Do you focus on the population that we're serving and the work that is incredibly important? Um, you know, it, presidents come and go, and, and rhetoric changes, and, and what, you know, it's important to focus on the work that you're doing and the, the students, in my book, or in my view, the students that we're serving and, and what they're going through, and so that's how I I keep myself, you know, level-headed and, and focused. Thank you so much. That's a nice note to end on. I think, so. <laughs> thanks again to our panel, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight on a rainy night. One more round of applause for them. Look for additional. Th this will be posted on the Project for an Informed Electorate's uh, website. We have a. YouTube page with other events on there that you can always, you know, if you miss something or you want to show it to friends, you can do it, do that in about two weeks. And we hope to see you at future events. Thanks for coming.